We have this desire, even craving, for control of our environments. We want truth, certainty, stability, security. We want to smooth out any possible risks and make life as easy as possible. Not all of these impulses are misguided, but they lead us to believe we can be in control. We can manage all the risks. We can know the truth. We can stabilize the situation and even go back to the way things were when sometimes we can't. Instead of learning to live with doubts and the ambiguity of life, we retreat into what's familiar. In this video, I want to talk about fear and control, the illusion of security, and how to live with uncertainty. I'm not going to reassure you on things. I'm going to show you the effects of our fear of losing control, and along the way, how to stop relying on someone else's reassurances. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Some people who believe things call their beliefs facts and knowledge. <clears throat> Being certain of something feels good. We're reassured by our faith. It's something we don't have to think about anymore. It's checked off, it's sorted out. And we have so many things to worry about in life, we want to know some things we don't have to question. Faith answers questions that scientific inquiry can't, and offers reassuring answers to questions about disturbingly uncertain things like uh, what happens after you die. The fear of death is pretty important in human history. If you're good, they tell me, you'll be rewarded after you die. I know my grandmother's up in heaven, they also want me to know, because she was such a sweet old lady. We fear death so much, we don't even accept it when others die. We tell ourselves they're still alive in some form. You know, maybe in heaven, or as a ghost, or whatever we choose to believe in. But we don't really have any evidence for life after death. Or heaven or hell, angels or ghosts. It's ultimately just a guess. We tell ourselves to feel good. Many people, when they realize things they've always believed might not be true, or just that they're going to die one day, they get scared. They retreat into their beliefs as a blanket to keep them safe. But there's a difference between accepting something as a fact and knowing something for sure. Me, I don't mind not knowing the future. I'd like to know the truth, but when I don't have the facts, or they're unclear, the truth is indeterminate. But most people want answers. You've noticed that recently, I bet. We're cooped up at home all day. It's frustrating. We want to know when all this will end. Okay, so who are you going to ask? The people who know the most about the subject have a variety of answers. It all depends. But that's not good enough for us. We have to know. Well, we don't have to know. We want to know. When you want something but can't have it, it's best to stop wanting and accept the way things are. If there's any chance you can get it, great, make a strategy. If not, stop wanting. Wanting is the root of all suffering. Laura Ingram, one of Fox's newsreading robots, practically begged the Twitterverse to give her a firm answer on this. I'll read it for you, at Laura Ingram. Americans need to know date certain when this will end. Not quite coherent, but let's keep going. The uncertainty for businesses, parents, and kids is just not sustainable. And Sami Zayn replied, 
Laura Ingram wants to talk to COVID-19's manager. She phrased it in that demanding language of angry voters, right? But I know begging when I see it. Please, please, someone give me an answer I can believe in. No one knows, Laura. You can't spend your way into control of this situation. You can't protest your way out of it. There's no one you can vote for or shoot. Pour yourself a glass of wine and pick up a book because we're going to be here for a while. I'm not saying you should be happy with your situation no matter what it is. Far from it. If you can change it, go ahead. Maybe I could help. But insisting on answers to impossible questions only leads you to the wrong answer. Reassuring for now, but disappointing soon enough. Desperate people will latch onto anything that comes from someone who sounds confident. Official spokespeople in the media always appear confident, but what they say is propaganda, so you don't know how much of it is true. Go ahead and listen to them, but evaluate what they say against everything else that's being said. Are they contradicting the experts? That might mean the experts are right. Are they going along with the experts? Well, that might mean the experts have been co-opted. But they might also be telling the truth. Whatever the truth is, we don't necessarily have access to it. Instead of getting frustrated and, say, leaving your homes to participate in mass protests, learn to live with uncertainty. It's not easy, but you can do it, and it will spare you all kinds of mental anguish down the road. Take a deep breath. Breathe slowly. Slow breathing calms you down. Accept that you don't know everything you'd like to know. Accept that what you do know might not be true. Look for other perspectives and evaluate them critically, too. When you start to accept how equivocal, unpredictable, and even absurd modern life is, you see it everywhere. Things make more sense. People make more sense. You become more content. You can still try to change things, but you can do it from a calmer, more calculated, more critical angle. If we act on our frustrations or our prejudices, we're likely to direct our rage at the wrong targets. You'll always have fuel for your prejudices. If you didn't trust China before, you probably think the consequences of this virus are all China's fault. If you didn't trust Trump before, you probably blame him. The truth is more nuanced. It always is. But we don't like nuance. We like conviction. Conviction sweeps nuance under the bed so we don't have to look at it. What if our conviction was misplaced? What if we were just grasping at straws when we arrived at that certainty? The future is not certain at all. Millions of people are dying to go back to normal. But what is normal? Spending all day working for a big corporation to make the rich richer? Doing whatever your boss tells you as well as you can and still living on the edge of bankruptcy? The risk of getting fired or furloughed for any reason? The violent crashes of the so-called business cycle? Living under the constant threat of incarceration and eviction? Paying landlords and bureaucrats to be allowed to live? Going into debt to afford medical treatment, the poverty, the wars, the racism, the mass shootings, the stress, the anxiety, the depression, Tiger King. Maybe normal was the problem. It certainly isn't stable. But if things seemed normal, people would believe things were fine again. And that's all they want. The urge to control one's surroundings is quite normal, common, natural. 
Most of what we see and do is about bringing a measure of control or stability to our lives. We don't want to suffer or die, so we do whatever we can to keep death at bay. Some obvious examples are gated communities with security guards or people with arsenals in their homes. Think of the idea of defending your house from intruders. Property and solitary living are not common in human history, but the modern belief we can remain safe inside our homes is pretty tempting. It's a bit more certainty, so we latch onto it. A house itself is a tool of control, to keep you safe from weather and nature and, you hope, other people. You get privacy, controlling who gets to see you. The house itself even gives you the power to control light. Have you got a gun? A gun represents control over life itself. But just going to work comes from fear. Our fear of the consequences of not having money, not having the means to feed yourself and live in your own home. If we accumulate enough cash, we can throw it at whatever problem we have. That gives us control, normality, for a bit longer, until the next crisis, which might be scheduled immediately. It might bankrupt most people, but if you've got millions of dollars to spare, eh, just millions, here you go. Again, that's not saying there's no point in trying to control these things, because there is. Of course we should be safe from the weather. Everyone should be. We have the resources to build houses for everyone, but a few people are hogging most of those resources. They keep millions or even billions in natural resources, money, shares, and possessions behind walls, denying it to even one of the people in the world who needs a safe home to live in and clean food to eat. Why do they do that? Why have more money than you could possibly spend in a lifetime? They're afraid. Even if they have a billion dollars, more money than anyone could possibly need, and which could help a lot of people, save them from dying, they still want more. They're so afraid of suffering and death, they're willing to kill other people. However, can guards and walls and guns and things and money actually stop you from dying? At best, at best, they can postpone pain and death. One thing you can be sure of is death will catch up to you eventually. Seems to me we should learn to accept that fact. But people who've been corrupted by money and power refuse to accept it. The more you get, the more you want. So they build bigger houses with more land. And they have to protect it, so they get more guards and cameras and guns, plus a helicopter on the roof and a bunker in the basement. And it's all in the name of maintaining the artificial life that they've created. Of course, it's not just the fear of death. We fear losing anything. Look at hoarding. People accumulate huge piles of what is essentially garbage because they refuse to part with it. They're holding on to something to avoid the pain of not having it. Drug addiction, of course, is the same. And getting clean is so hard because you fear living without the thing you love. The fear of losing sometimes leads to violence. You know that. Some people fear uh, losing a person so much they use violence against people they love to force them to stay. They fear losing someone so much they push them away. And yet when someone leaves you, you're still there. It hurts, I know. But people leave. And you find someone new. Or you don't. Either way, you die alone. 
You can train yourself to accept that by being brutally honest with yourself every day. But you can also train yourself to run away from it. We're always grasping at a semblance of normality and stability and order. The propaganda we're brought up on feeds into our fear of change by assuring us the current order is the most stable system in existence and the only one that enables you to get rich and leave risk and uncertainty behind forever. That's why the usual response when someone suggests eliminating the state or even just disarming the police is without state control, you know, over everything, all would be chaos. I've made a few videos about why that wouldn't necessarily be the case and certainly has not been throughout history, so check them out, but they won't convince everyone. Not everyone's ready to step into the unknown. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple of things that illustrate some of the propaganda we're expected to believe in. First is this cartoon that appeared in The New Yorker uh, about four years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's on a plane, and uh, there's an angry guy with a mustache standing up saying, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? And then, and then they vote. <laughs> it's a liberal satire of right-wingers who believed in Trump's campaign rhetoric, like these smug politicians have lost touch with regular people like us, I'm a regular Joe just like you people, and I'm going to shake things up in Washington. So, Trump was hardly the first politician to claim he was fighting the establishment for the people. Then there's this one, of a plane. I'll describe that too. Two pictures of a plane, really. One says, ordinary political plane, and it shows a plane, it says left wing and right wing. American political plane, and there's no left wing on it. <laughs> and it says, I wonder why the plane can't fly. Okay. At least it recognizes U.S. politics as pretty much only right-wing, but the rest of it's wrong. First, a plane is a great example of where a few really well-trained people should be in charge. Of course you don't vote for the pilot. A flight is a dictatorship. I'm okay with that. But a plane is not analogous to politics. They're two totally different things. Politicians are not in charge of everything. They don't control things, or as people often say, run the country. You can't run a country. The belief there's a small group of people in charge of things can be reassuring, because it feeds us the illusion of stability and security. Don't worry, people are in charge, things are happening. We need people to be in charge, or else everything will fall apart. That's all we need to hear, really, from a young age, to think the government is, and should be, in control of everything. There's so much wrong with this thinking. Though, starting with the fact that there's nothing to be in charge of, Everything that happens is a result of a million different factors, not a few people whose job is actually to grapple for media attention. You've got to get past thinking there's something you can point to called a country that isn't just a, a picture on a map. A country is, among many other things, a whole bunch of unrelated people who would be able to run their own lives without being threatened with state violence. No one who says presidents and prime ministers run the country know what people actually do. This illusion of control gives rise to conspiracy theories. Some of the people who figure out they've always been lied to by the powers that be gravitate towards lies about a secret cabal that runs everything, usually a Jewish one because anti-Semitism has a long history in Europe. 
And about 120 years ago, elements of the Russian ruling class put out a pamphlet called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, claiming it had been written by the Jews, as if there's any the Jews, about their plans for Jews to reign supreme because the Russian state was under pressure and planning a pogrom, and these are classic divide-and-conquer tactics. Henry Ford printed half a million copies after it had been debunked as a hoax. The Nazis took these lies and ran with them. All of today's conspiracy bullshit about Jews come from that. Uh, AstroTurf! You know who's responsible for that, don't you? The Jews! <laughs> Oh, the Jews hate Chris. They always have. They always have. But some of what these people read has nothing racist or nothing overtly racist. Like, the people in control for them are the Illuminati, or the Freemasons, or the Satanists, or lizard-like aliens, or whatever Alex Jones and David Icke tell them to think. They've already been led to believe all their lives a few people are in charge and in control, whatever that means. So it's easy to nudge them in the direction of thinking a specific identifiable group right at the top of everything. Not only has power over all the world's banks and governments, but they also pulled off 9-11, invented the Holocaust, staged school shootings to criminalize guns, lied about vaccines, lied about aliens in Roswell, lied about the shape of the Earth, for some reason, still can't figure out why, and filmed the moon landing in Stanley Kubrick's rec room. Then QAnon comes along and tells them all kinds of nonsense about what supposedly goes on at the top echelons of society, and millions of people take it as fact. Look, you don't need to believe in wild-eyed conspiracies if you just learn how capitalism and the state work. I've made lots of videos on it, and I don't know if there's a really simple metaphor that describes it all. Sorry. The point of the system is not to run the world or control society. The ruling class wants stability for itself. But when you look at what it does, like take the wealth created by the working class and use police to commit violence against them, you realize that stability doesn't extend to their victims. They use the instruments of the state to make their violence seem necessary to keep order. It's not just a few people in one kind of identifiable organization, though. It's a diverse group of maybe, maybe millions of people around the world, certainly many thousands. They're the ones who make political decisions, but they might be in competition with each other. If they want to build on the same land, or their firms are in competition, or one law would help one guy's profits but hurt another's, or they support different political parties or different sides in a war. They're united in maintaining their power, their hegemony over the working class, but they don't agree on every decision and they don't make them together in small, smoky rooms. Those high-level conferences where, where the supposedly most powerful people gather, like Davos, Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, and, or even just the UN General Assembly, aren't about making all the world's decisions. They aren't building a new world order or global government. Or if they are, they're sure taking their damn time. These events are as much media spectacle as anything to bolster this illusion that something's being done about the world's problems. Sure, powerful people can use these meetings to make major decisions together, but they could use the phone for that, too. A second problem with thinking of politics as a plane, yes, we've gone back there, is flying a plane requires specialized knowledge and skill. None of the jobs commonly considered politics are like that. 
The guy raising his hand in that cartoon might not be qualified to fly a plane, but for sure he can vote the way some lobbyist tells him to. In fact, there's really only one skill you need to be a successful politician. One criterion for success in politics. Do you know what it is? You need to be a good actor. That's it. You put on a smile for the cameras and deliver a stirring speech, then make backroom deals the rest of the day. The third thing wrong with the plain metaphor is its belief we somehow need the right wing. Why? Right wing politics is bullshit. It's based on lies and invented, imagined problems. Sorry to be so blunt, but it's true. That's what my first video was on, so you can check it out if you like. It's kind of poor quality, but the audio is fine. Right-wing policies and attitudes are great examples of fear of change. They're so afraid of demographic change, for instance, ooh, not demographic change, that they're fine with breaking up families and sticking people in concentration camps indefinitely. That's a mighty strong fear right there. The idea that we need the right is like saying we need homeopathy to advance medical science. We also saw in that meme the illusion of stability, that there can be some kind of balance just because parties that call themselves right and left parties share power. People who think this way don't understand right or left-wing politics. Left-wing politics is a threat to the established order, and right-wing politics seeks to preserve it. That's why leftists are radicals, Liberals and Democrats are not left-wing. Right-wingers are conservatives and reactionaries. And centrists are just confused. I made a series of videos on political attitudes right after my first one. You can check that out, too. The people who have power in the current system will always support the right-wing in its violence against the left. There's no fusing of right and left, like people have tried to do for years, because they're contradictory. And when people try, the right always wins out. The right uses however much violence is necessary to preserve the status quo. And they know some people preserve, prefer even outright fascism to freedom. So they've always got this leftist boogeyman to scare you with. Sure, they're killing all the minorities and enslaving the rest of us, but at least someone's in control. Imagine how bad things could be. So we're taught, we're trained to fear losing the supposed stability of the current social order. So any radical changes must be wrong. We learn all the excuses we need to defend it. That goes for all our beliefs. We don't want to let go of any of them, because they represent a kind of security for us. They represent stability in a world of chaos. Ultimately, we're taught to fear the devil we don't know and love the devil we do. It closes our eyes to new ideas and makes freedom sound like a nightmare. So maybe embracing the unknown and the ambiguous and the uncertainties of life isn't for everyone. But surely when we look around, we can admit radical change is needed. Social problems have causes and they have solutions. But we might have to embrace the unknown to find them. Thanks everyone for watching. Please drop a like if you learned something, a comment or a question, share this video, Ooh, and subscribe so that I know you like me. Please?